Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our panel discussion on do we have the right financial and insurance instruments to deal with the impact of climate change? My name is Ulrike Elsenhuber. I'm Senior Relationship Manager at the BIS, and it is my pleasure to welcome my four panelists. Bertrand Badré is Managing Partner and Founder of Blue Like an Orange Sustainable Capital. Dr. Jeffrey Bohn is Senior Advisor at the Swiss Re Institute. Dr. Raphael Del Villar Alrich is Chief Advisor to the Governor of Banco de Mexico. Dr. Andreas Dombret is Global Senior Advisor to Oliver Wyman and lecturing at Columbia University. From 2010 to 2018, Andreas served on the Executive Board of Deutsche Bundesbank and represented the Bundesbank in the Supervisory Board of the ECB. A very warm welcome to all of you and thank you for joining us virtually. Before we start with our discussion, I would like to mention that this session is being recorded and that all attendees are welcome to post any questions they may have on the Q&A box on the left-hand side of the screen. With this, let me turn to my first question for discussion, which is, which practical solutions do financial insurance instruments offer to deal with the impact of climate change? Andreas, recent estimates by the non-for-profit charity CDP and consultancy Oliver Wyman indicate that there's a 4 trillion euro excess supply of loan volumes, which banks are looking to dedicate to sustainable financing initiatives. But currently the demand by corporates is still too small. Which practical solutions do you see to address this issue? Thank you, Ulrike. And, um Hello to everyone who is uh, listening in. Thank you for being invited to this conference as I'm the first. Let me thank uh, Luis Pereira and everybody um, of the four institutions to organize, or organize this um, conference, which I, will believe, which I believe is going to be one of the most important, if not the most important conference on this topic for, for, for quite some time. So um, how to finance a greener world? That's basically Ulrike, what, what you are asking. And before we tackle that, let me take the stage and say that it is my very strong belief that fighting climate change is one of the key challenges uh, of our century and one of the most important risks um, to the planet. The world economy and our entire society face really a fundamental um, transformation uh, towards uh, decarbonization. Fortunately, there are many activities um, happening at the level of uh, single corporations, single firms, individual countries, and supranational institutions such as the European Union in the form of the European Green Deal Action Plan. So we are seeing action. Um, now it is unquestionable that such a transformation is costly and will require substantial financial resources to be dedicated to these efforts. And um, as you imply in your question, Ulrike, the financial services sector will play a pivotal role in catalyzing and uh, in enabling the flow of financial resources. Um, but we are very much at the beginning of the journey. And this is why it's important to note, as you said in your question, that um, there is a 4 trillion euro excess supply of loan volumes which banks are looking and are interested in um, dedicating to sustainable finan financing initiatives. But currently, the demand for this type of financing by corporates is still too small. So we have excess financings ready and too little demand for those financings. At the same time, new financing vehicles such as green bonds are very much in the public and you read about them all the time and they're capturing a lot of market attention but if you look at the size of those green bonds um, uh, and despite the growth these green bonds have they only represent a fraction of the market so the green bonds may not be the solution going forward to really solve all the issues and one of the major risks we, which we are currently facing is at least i think so that the type that the pipes of the financial system which are supposed to channel the required financial resources to the best possible uses, that these pipes are actually presently uh, clogged up. And uh, if I may, I would like to use this uh, stage to um, 
suggest that there are three key factors behind this risk, which require our, uh, all of our attention, our joint attention and action. And the first key factor I would like to call temporal externalities. Now, the consequences of uh, climate change, as we all know, may not be felt for the next years uh, or may not, may not be felt for the next decades. Behavioral finance teaches us that it is therefore rather unlikely that these consequences will be factored in and that these consequences will be priced in a fully rational manner into today's decision making, unfortunately. Market participants are at the very risk of ignoring um, or under valuating the consequences their actions today have in the far future and they may choose not to go the extra mile necessary for finding uh, and funding green activities at a price which reflects all consequences and this is a major key risk factor going forward now the second key factor i would like to mention uh, uh, i would like to call the lack of of a frame of reference the key objective for the financial system is to channel the right amount and the right type of financing to the right transformation initiatives. However, it is uh, far from obvious how a good transformation initiative can actually be identified given the many different perspectives and their inherent complexity. A dilemma is looming, I think. While it will be difficult to ensure um, financial resources are put to an efficient use without at least a few common principles, there is actually a significant risk of overcomplication, and there is a risk of creating a huge amount of green tape which may harm our effort overall. And lastly, as the third key factor, um, I think that a new toolkit is required, and this is actually exactly your question. Mm -hmm. Now, current financing structures were not specifically designed to deal with the type of transformation initiative which is required for a greener world. We're not prepared for this transformation. Some of the financing required may not appear feasible using the rules of standard instruments. Just think of straight loans where the leverage may become too high or just think of equity investments where there are governance implications. Um, so the standard toolkit may just not work for this transformation. As such, the transformation will rely on players inventing new ways to accommodate these requirements and the key challenge is how to create the right incentives for this innovation and for them inventing these new rules in order to clear the hurdles which i just described i'm convinced a much closer cooperation between the public sector the financial sector uh, and the corporates the corporate world will be required now corporates and financial services players will need to come up with proposals on how the flow of financing can be unlocked, while the public sector needs actually deployed all political levers at its, dis at its disposal to ensure that incentives align and money actually can be challenged, uh, can, can be challenged, uh, channeled to the intended users. Now, this should, by the way, for the public sector also include the consideration of how to bring the regulatory toolkit to bear, which refers to my former activity um, in the supervisory world. So let me sum up. The world has a lot of assets at its disposal to make change happen. And we even have excess loans trying to, to fund uh, the climate change. Uh, and this is, again, not only at the regional level, it is at a global level. But it will need to learn, the world will need to learn how to work on a cross-industry basis in order to unleash the energy which is required to solve this biggest uh, problem of the planet. Let me let me stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andreas. I think you have uh, raised very valid points there. Uh, maybe, Jeff, um, uh, if we continue on Andreas' point that some financial channels uh, that could steer money towards the best uh, possible solutions appear to be blocked up, which practical solutions do you see to remove the, block, the blockage? Yeah, before I answer that, I also want to thank the, the organizers and, and also indicate that uh, I'm with the Swiss Re Institute, so I'm going to talk about where things are headed. It's not necessarily where the insurance industry is today or where, where banking is. I'd like to talk about both uh, 
types of instruments in, in trying to address this challenge. But before I, I get to the, the topic of, of the incentives around the specific instruments, I think it's important to highlight four trends that are creating new opportunities. I agree that it's very difficult today, but uh, I'm quite optimistic given these trends. And so what these trends are, uh, predominantly in the technology space, is the fact that we're seeing uh, faster bandwidth. So the rollout of 5G is gonna be quite important to reduce what's called the latency between identifying consequence of certain actions that can be potentially tied into different types of financial instruments, whether they be uh, a, a green bond or a, a bond that might be tied to carbon emission or to an insurance contract that might have a parametric trigger related to uh, a climate or sustainability indicator. So that's, that's one important trend. Secondly, the, there's much development, uh, what I'll loosely call the, the the platform orchestration space. So this is where you have corporates and also some governments that are looking at creating these digital platforms. Some of them might be exchanges. Some of them could be uh, infor information repositories. Uh, this is all quite important to make the information more widely available so that uh, the different parties who are relevant to solving these problems, whether they be regulators or even those of us in the financial services sector trying to develop new new products can can in fact get access to uh, the the different mechanisms to facilitate the risk transfer and some of these new uh, financing mechanisms and this is tied up with some of the trends around uh, how we we manage our digital identity how we're managing all this this data you know we've, we've gone through this this uh, phase in the world where we're, we're deluged with data. And I think the next step is to filter it. You know, I, I, you know, I feel like the, the notion of a, a web 2.0 or a web 3.0 is really about figuring out how to get the right data to the right person for the right decision. And I think that that is, is a, a trend that will be important in this space as well. And then related to data, there's new data sets that are becoming available, particularly coming out of the remote sensing community. Uh, so you have uh, some of the more traditional sources, such as your, your standard satellites, but there are new types of satellite data, uh, something called uh, SAR, synthetic aperture radar data, that, that will improve our ability to look across wide swaths of the planet, and that can assist us in, in designing and, and, and uh, implementing some of these new instruments. And then finally, it all has to be tied together with some kinds uh, of machine intelligence. Uh, it could be the new machine learning or artificial intelligence, but some of the more standard tools on the right platforms with the right data, I think, can, can make a difference. And later on, I'll talk about uh, some specific examples of, of uh, where we see uh, some, some interesting opportunities. Now, one of the things that's quite important in all of this is that the actions of different actors or stakeholders in the global economy, uh, those consequences need to be tied more closely back to the action. And that means that there, there, there is a, a place for uh, more and better designed regulation that can make the consequences of certain activities actually costly if they are, in fact, leading us down a path that we know is, is not going to be uh, in the in the benefit of everyone, if you know, if you go back to basic economic theory, uh, the the whole idea is to to do a better job of di defining property rights and identifying the costs of certain actions. So then that those those actions can be properly uh, uh, the risk of those actions can be properly priced, and then you can develop markets, whether they be in certain types of uh, green bonds or. Uh, some of these new insurance uh, policies that can, in fact, drive the corporate development and even infrastructure development in, in a path that, that meets more than just uh, short-term financial uh, return targets. And so I think that's, that's a part of this that, that is also quite important, because if there's not a direct cost associated with activities, you know, such as your carbon emissions, or even if you're destroying uh, ecosystems or biodiversity or what you know whatever the consequences then it's hard to do the risk management uh, even under the best of circumstances 
So I think this is this is all setting up the the stage whereby we can come up with some interesting new uh, uh, financial securities, both in the in the uh, the asset markets and in the the insurance markets, that can better align incentives so that we can get a better handle on managing some of these risks. And there, there, there's already an interesting shift that's occurring in insurance that I think uh, helps this. And that is a move away just from what I would call understand and cover. So that's where you analyze the risk, you write an insurance contract, so you cover the risk, and then you just wait until uh, a downside event occurs and then you have a payout. The, that, that's historically been how insurance is run. That is now transforming into what I would call predict and prevent. And this is where we can use this combination of the new data, the new machine intelligence, some of these new platforms to facilitate predictive uh, maintenance, predictive resilience. And this can all be shaped in a way that can, can assist us in, in creating uh, financial instruments that, that can in fact do a better job of directly addressing these long-term climate change issues in the context of resilience. And the, the, there's some very interesting developments in, in this context uh, that I think will bode well for creating new capabilities uh, that can potentially address some of these, these climate change uh, concerns. And so I'll, I'll leave it there. I'm going to talk about some examples a little bit later as we get into this discussion. Okay, very good. Uh, maybe let's turn to Raphael now uh, to get uh, also the emerging markets uh, perspective. Um, Raphael, you are based in Mexico. How, which practical solutions do you see from the emerging markets perspective? Well, thank you very much, Ulrike, and thank you. I, I also join my my co-panelists to, to, in congratulating the organizers of this uh, wonderful conference. No? Uh, and it's really enlightening. Um, so, yes, I will be speaking from an emerging market perspective, but I also will be taking a more um, specific uh, examples so that uh, to guide the discussion. Um, first, I, I would like to, to emphasize as what Jeffrey Bond just mentioned about predict and prevent, because I, I really love this concept uh, and it's it's wonderful uh, to, to to try to move the insurance uh, industry in 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 this direction. Um, so um, with that, I I will um, um, divide my comments, um, you know, some practical comments in three parts, uh, trying to shed some light. A precisely on emerging and, and LDCs. Uh, so the first um, comment uh, is on uh, insurance as a means to correct the, the disincentive of firms to invest in increasing their resiliency to climate events when they expect that the damages are caused by their accidents will at least partly be borne by society. A, a second comment, uh, I will spend you know, a few words on the role the insurance industry can play on identifying and fostering measures such as public investments in adaptation to reduce risk and increase insurability. And the final comment, uh, and that, this comment I will take into the next uh, round also, uh, importantly, uh, I will argue for scaling up uh, nascent uh, insurance schemes aimed at preservation of natural areas with high biodiversity value. Hopefully, I will be able to convince some of you that impact investors can be brought to the table uh, from the capital market side to reduce premia on the insurance side. I do not know how much of a convincing effort will have to be made also on the part of managers of these valuable natural areas to strengthen governance and transparency so that impact investors uh, can be assured. So let me turn to the, to the first example. A liability insurance for climate-related accidents can be used as a tool to correct incentives of firms when in the absence of such insurance, 
the losses uh, caused by the accident would otherwise be borne largely by society. For instance, tailing dam collapses of mining companies in emerging countries due to, say, very abundant rain, of course, related to climate change, are examples of uh, climate-related disasters where downstream river pollution and damages are often not entirely paid by the company that causes them. This is particularly relevant in emerging and LDCs because in these countries, sanctions for such accidents are often in practice only a fraction of the damages they impose on society and ecosystems. Because uninsured firms know that they will not have to pay or pay in full the damages they cause, they are willing to take excessive risks. As a consequence, the probability of the accident occurring in the first place is too high because of the exposed socialization of damages to people and nature. This is reflected in the firm avoiding to make all the necessary ex ante investments that would, con that would contain the probability of the climate-related accident to its sufficient level. Insurance and reinsurance companies working under international standards are likely to demand such firms to undertake the necessary ex ante investments that reduce expected damages in case the climate event occurs as a prerequisite for providing liability insurance. A second comment, the insurance industry has in some cases uh, played a role in identifying and fostering measures such as recommending speci specific public investments in adaptation that reduce risk and increase insurability. In regions with high exposure to climate events, insurers may even walk away from markets if minimum risk mitigation measures are not taken. In the case of flooding, for example, measures could include the construction of levees or the promotion of nature-based solutions to reduce this risk. Where insurers are not present, or have little penetration. MDBs, multilateral development banks or international financial institutions could play a role in bringing them in, in to start a dialogue on adaptation measures that are necessary for the development, not only of the insurance market, but also mortgages and economic activity. Such adaptation measures and investments when tied to nature-based solutions are likely to have significant spillover effects on the economy and its sustainability. A third comment, parametric insurance is starting to address the conservation and restoration of natural protected areas, which provide valuable ecosystem services to society. Natural protected areas are key for the conservation of ecosystems and play a role in facilitating adaptation and mitigation to climate change. However, these areas are also vulnerable to climate events. Severe winds, rains, floods, droughts, and fires can have destructive effects on these ecosystems. Being able to react to regenerate damaged ecosystems is key to preserve the services they provide. They inc these, ser these services include the regulation of temperature and humidity, moderation of floods and droughts, purification of air and water, soil conservation, water production, carbon capture and storage, source of livelihoods, pest and disease control, among others. According to an AXA study, coral reefs globally provide 36 billion a year in economic value through tourism, reduce 97% of wave energy and significant, you know, which, which, which helps to maintain the coast, the beaches, and significantly reduce property damages during storms. For now, I stop here. Thank you, Ulrike. Thank you very much, uh, Rafael. Uh, let's uh, turn to Bertrand now. Bertrand, you are a managing partner and founder of an investment company that mobilizes capital for emerging market companies to help them achieve the sustainable development goals. 
which practical solutions do you think do financial and insurance instruments offer to deal with the impact of climate change? Bertrand, I think you're on mute. As I often say, we need three years of lockdown to get used to this button. Sorry about that. <laughs> Uh, thank you, thank you very much, Ulrike. Let me join Andreas, Jeff, and, and Raphael to thank the organizer for, for a very impressive events at a turning moment in time. Uh, we've discussed the world after for many months. Now it seems that the world after starts tomorrow. So uh, what we say might have an impact. You never know. No, thank you very much. I think your your question is the right question, and, and my three co-speakers have, have, have already said a lot about it. The, the question today is less about the what and the why but more and more about the how, and I would say how seriously. I think this is really the, the important word. Uh, I think for many people outside this virtual room, the question would be, okay, my God, there is too much talk, there is a lot of buzz, there is a lot of acronyms, there is a lot of things going on, uh, but are we really serious about it? Is there, is it, is there something real happening? Are, are we really shifting something, or is it just more about the same? So on the positive side, I believe that the socialization of the idea is well advanced. Uh, the fact that people understand what is at stake uh, is important. And, and this event actually is a proof of that. Uh, denial of all these issues is vanishing. I mean, there was, uh, I mean, not so long ago, people were still debating whether what we were discussing was real or not. Now it's kind of behind us. Uh, even in the US where I still live, uh, it's, it's in retreat somewhat. Uh, second point, as Andreas said, uh, there is a lot of assets, there is money, and so certain people might even uh, joke at the fact that there is a lot more money since uh, the sanitary crisis. They don't understand whether this money is really free, uh, but they think that money is no longer the limiting factor. Uh, in parallel to that, a number of uh, investors uh, are searching for yield. In a world where interest rates are very low, you need to make your money somewhere. And uh, what we are discussing might be an area for, for this somewhere. Uh, people are also searching because there is real pressure for impact, sustainability, ESG, you name it. So as a result, I think we are facing a real window where we can try new things. And my predecessors have mentioned a number of things happening. Um, for instance, we've been discussing in my previous capacity as Managing Director of the World Bank, and I've worked a lot on financing of infrastructure. Uh, to the risk of provoking people today, I would say that uh, infrastructure finance is no longer a real problem anymore. I would echo what Andrea said, uh, when there is good project, you find money today. That's the problem. It's the other way around. The problem is the lack of project. This should be the priority. Uh, one of the French ministers of finance in the 19th century said, if you do good politics, I find you good money. And that's exactly where we are today. So the big challenge is, is really to move from, you know, a, a scattered projects all over the world to something which is really scalable and where people feel comfortable to, to, to bring this to an industrial scale. Scaling up means more investment opportunities, more bankable and investable opportunities. And that should be the focus of all institutions whose job it is in particular, I mean, they can refer to my previous job, the various public institutions in charge of financing development uh, in advanced economy as well as in emerging and developing economies. And thank you for your, for your words, Raphael. We need also to learn to blend more, uh, to do blend forces. It's not just about blending finance, it's about blending the expertise, blending the culture. Uh, it's about blending action. It's, it's at the heart of what I've tried to develop with my own investment model with Inter-American Development Bank. But the point is, uh, we need to move from putting pilots together to, as I said, industrialize this. We need to blend, we need to, this, to uh, increase the level of preparation, we need to increase the systemic de-risking of things at a scale which we have not seen yet. And I think the point is, is really to, to talk and debate less in panels and move to action. I've, I've, I'm afraid I've said that many, many times, and I will keep repeating it. And I think it's a critical test for the, for the development system. I was expecting the sanitary crisis to be a wake-up call to the system. To be honest, I've not seen it yet. Maybe I've not seen everything, but I think we're still very much in the more of the same mode. So we need to converge also. It's not scaling up, it's not enough. We need to converge on standards, on labels. There are too many labels, and in a way, too many labels might kill the label. Uh, we, we need to, uh, to converge. Uh, if you want this to be sustainable, if you have 50,000 labels, people will get even more lost and we lose trust in the system. Mm -hmm. so we have 
we have a critical challenge ahead of us, which goes beyond the renewable uh, infrastructure field. Uh, climate change is not just about infrastructure, as many, uh, a big number of people still believe. It's also about uh, our production of goods and services. I mean, uh, cement, cars, etc. It's about a uh, value chain, trade. How do we transport it? It's about construction. Uh, as the International Agency for Energy recently reminded us, it's a true transformation revolution that is needed. It's not an incremental job, it's a profound transformation. I, I, dare, I, I mean, I'm always nervous to use the word revolution because being French, this rings many bells and people say, as a French, they, they expect to abolish the privilege of the mind, keep the king and, and take the Bastille and it's done. We all know around this table that these things take time. Uh, so we, we need a revolution, but we, we need to do it with different methodologies. So we need to have a radical approach at scale uh, on the retrofitting of housing, on the decarbonation of transport, etc. Uh, we need a radical changes in financial approaches. Uh, we need new approaches in the VC industry, in the private equity industry, in the insurance industry, etc. Uh, we need to discuss exactly how do we incorporate impact in a credible manner uh, in our financial model. We need to have a radical change in the way we report. It's a question of credibility. This is central. If people don't believe that what you do is real, they will not give you back your trust. So it's about proper disclosure. It's about things which are readable, understandable, clean, which are auditable and audited. We need a radical change about the measurement of things. It's not just about uh, the CO2 pricing. Uh, it's about a, a, a massive expansion of principles like the TCFD principles. It goes with the accounting standards, the, the fiduciary duties of the people who manage your money, compensation policy. So it means, uh, as I said, to open the hood, take your toolbox, uh, put your hand in the engine and work on the engine. And that's really, I'm, I'm coming to the end. This should be the focus. Uh, if we want to move to practical things, we'll find practical things, but the practical things will come if we have the appropriate uh, framework. So thank you, uh, thank you very much. Uh, for, for this opportunity. I think we are at a turning point and uh, it's not lost, but it's not won yet. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Beto. I think uh, during the first round of, of um, answers that you have been providing, uh, all of you have been providing uh, many uh, practical ideas and solutions have already been raised. So maybe let's come to the second question that I would like to pose to all panelists. How would you concretely implement the practical solutions uh, you, you proposed? Um, Jeff, uh, in fact, in the um, answer to, your, to the first question, you mentioned that new financial insurance instruments could incentivize a stronger focus on climate change. Which concrete instruments are these? Yeah, so, so let me talk about uh, a few examples of concrete instruments that uh, at least I, I know people are talking about, and there's a few cases of, of, of even some small issues. And uh, I'll start with uh, resilience bonds. Uh, you know, the, the, they come in, in different labels. Uh, you know, sometimes you hear uh, green bonds, et cetera. And I think the important thing about these particular, uh, these particular instruments is the the structure of the financial instrument uh, is tied back to some kind of an indicator. So, you know, I'm aware of a few uh, example issuances where the, uh, the proceeds of the bond is used to, say, reduce carbon emissions, and then the uh, payment responsibilities are related back to something associated with how well the actually did in reducing those. So that would be an example of a, of a resilient bond. Another, uh, you know, quite innovative approach, although it's, it's hard to scale, are bonds where the uh, the coupon payments are a function of how the the proceeds have been used to fix a problem that then makes the entity eligible for certain types of grants from NGOs or from governments. So I'm, you know, I'm aware of some uh, securities that have, uh, and these may in fact even have been issued, but around uh, improving the the uh, response to wildfire in California, and the payment is a function of whether the work qualifies uh, the entity to to get grants from the government that can then pay the the investor. Now this this improves resilience. It addresses the climate uh, the transition risk, 
And also many of the asset owners, which I think we've touched on a little bit in this conversation so far, uh, they already have uh, uh, an allocation in what's called their strategic asset allocation to social impact investing or green investing. And in fact, there's not enough supply of this type of paper. So I think that, that this is really a call for everybody in the industry to think more creatively how we come up with more of these uh, uh, resilience bonds and these types of security. So this is one this is one uh, development that, that I'm very optimistic about because as we have better data and people become much more uh, innovative with respect to how they, they deliver these securities, this creates new opportunity. Secondly is, uh, and, and this was already touched on uh, earlier uh, uh, about uh, parametric insurance, but this is also another trend that I think is quite exciting in the space. And just, just to be very specific, parametric insurance products eliminate the need for costly claims analysis in the event of a uh, some kind of downside disaster hazard. So instead of having a claims adjuster look at the, the damage, you have an indicator that's related uh, to whatever you're trying to incentivize, uh, and that, that drives the, the payment. And in fact, uh, there, there was one very interesting uh, product that uh, was issued in, in, in Mexico, in fact, where you had an area of coral reef uh, uh, cover in, near the Yucatan Peninsula, and the, the payment is a function of wind speed over a certain part of the ocean. Now, th this goes back to my earlier points. This would not have been possible if you didn't have GPS if you did not have the ability to track wind speed on a real-time basis, uh, and the technology created an opportunity to, to offer a parametric solution that was quite interesting. In fact, the challenge was actually much more organizational and institutional. It was getting the cooperation of all the different uh, parties uh, to work together. But I think that despite some of those difficulties, this is a good example of, of what we could expect to see in the future where we tie back specific indicators that are now being more regularly measured in a way that can promote resilience, promote sustainability, and, and, uh, and, and hopefully move against climate change, and if not, uh, at least uh, provide some degree of adaptability. The third type of uh, instrument is just broadly called uh, insurance-linked securities, or ILS, and there's uh, a lot of development in this space uh, specifically thinking in the resilience and sustainability area to offer on some emerging digital exchanges new kinds of, uh, of insurance investment opportunities. And, and these might uh, have the structure of some of these other approaches that, that are already uh, underway. The difference is this may be a, a more attractive way for asset owners to get uh, insurance payouts, which are typically, or in, sorry, insurance risk that, that's much less correlated with the rest of their portfolios. And so I think that's that's also an exciting development. We see continued development in the ILS market. And then the, the final point is not so much a, uh, a financial instrument or an insurance contract, but rather the development of new uh, uh, platforms that I call resilience as a service, so RIAS. And this, this uh, is a concrete example of how you could deliver the predict and prevent capability. So for example, uh, I'm aware of developments in the supply chain space, which has both, uh, uh, it both drives questions of climate change and, it, and it's also affected by climate change. And I think that those are examples of where these new resilience as a service platforms can be used to build in more preventative measures so that you can preempt problems. And even if you're clever enough about it, influence uh, the different stakeholders to move in directions that in fact mitigate climate change and create more adaptability. And in fact, make the, the world more resilient. Uh, I'll end by saying in the asset management space, the past few years have seen a lot of enthusiasm around what's called ESG uh, type 
uh, investments. So the E is environment, S is social, and D is governance. Uh, I actually think it should be ESG plus R. So it's, uh, it should be environment, social governance, and resilience. And this, this discussion here today is a good example of how we can think about specifically designing solutions and securities to address uh, resilience questions, uh, which is just as important as, as some of these other questions uh, that, that, that are already being addressed in other contexts. So I'll hand it back to you there. Very interesting, Jeff. So you're basically um, suggesting to link uh, bond payments or uh, insurance premium to the desired outcomes, which I find a very good uh, way basically to incentivize going forward and also your um, your uh, last uh, point on the ESGR investment types could also be something uh, worth considering. Uh, I've seen uh, that Raphael was nodding uh, when you uh, were talking about the insurance linked securities. Maybe I'll uh, address Raphael now and uh, hand the microphone to you regarding the practical solutions that you would see. Well, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, uh, so yes, let me. Um, um, so let me refer to the, the to also. To, I will. I will also, of course, go, go to the example that uh, that Jeffrey was uh, talking about the Yucatan Peninsula because uh, that will be my main comment of this uh, intervention. Um, but uh, let me just go back to the the, the uh, three examples that I was uh, referring to in my first intervention. So in 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 the case of the liability insurance example. Um, uh, to uh, you know, when the accident occurs, um, uh, there may be several reasons why damages are socialized. So I would just want to spend just uh, because of inadequate sanctions, lax implementation of environmental laws, or other reasons. The first in emer the firms in emerging and LDCs having the accident may not pay entirely for the damages they cause to society. So let's look at solutions. You know, the, the obvious natural solution is to um, regulate, to establish mandatory liability insurance to cover accidents of firms in industries or activities that can impose on society and nature significant damages. It's clearly um, the, the first best uh, theoretical solution. However, for several years, one of Mexico's environment protection laws requires firms to contract liability insurance against climate-related catastrophes. But the secondary regulations necessary to implement the law have yet to be issued. So there are other uh, difficulties in implementing the, such regulations. Also, uh, and very importantly, after the latest uh, tailing dam accident in Brazil in 2019, insurance premia increased significantly and subscription conditions tightened. Okay, so let's look at that other solutions. Um, so one would be for different uh, stakeholders of the firms in these industries to be able to know how um, these firms are minimizing the risks of accidents. So we can leverage on, on precisely the um, importance of information and um, developments and uh, uh, that that are occurring that Jeffrey was uh, referring to in his first part intervention um, now uh, in this conference in particular mandatory TCFD disclosures has been repeatedly being proposed as having great importance and I agree with it but uh, one would need to ask whether the disclosures of firms in this industry industries would also need to be verifiable while things are moving at a high speed on TCFD, emerging and LDCs still have a, a steep curve to climb. Uh, other financial market actors are already having a role in correcting incentives for too much risk taking on the part of firms that can cause significant negative externalities on society and nature. Um, it, it, Jeffrey also mentioned the ESG R, no? the, the R being resilience. So ESG data and rating providers generate decision useful information on companies' risk management and governance practices and are increasingly relevant for investors and other stakeholders that can influence firms' decision making. However, much of the information is still not in the public domain. 
Also, institutional investors are well positioned to send the appropriate signals to these firms through passive and active strategies. Now, let me move to the role of catastrophe insurance, parametric insurance, in preserving the positive externalities of natural capital. Natural protected areas are key for the conservation of ecosystems and priority species and play a role in facilitating adaptation and mitigation to climate change. Innovative insurance schemes starting, are starting to be used for the conservation and restoration of natural ecosystems. This is the case, for instance, of the uh, example that Jeffrey mentioned uh, of the natural park of Puerto Morelos in the Quintana Roo Peninsula in Mexico. This insurance covers the damage done by hurricanes to coral reefs and beaches from Cancun to Tulum since 2018. The covered area includes a part of the second largest coral reef in the world. When a hurricane hits, coral reefs may be broken, but can survive if glued back promptly. Coral reefs not only preserve a valuable biodiverse marine life, but importantly help avoid the erosion of beaches caused by hurricanes as they reduce the size of the waves that hit the beaches. Parametric insurance can provide the natural park with resources to restore the coral reef and the beaches after a hurricane hits. In turn, insurers and reinsurers are likely to transfer the risk to capital markets. They do so by selling cash bonds or you know, other innovative instruments that uh, also Jeffrey was just mentioning. Uh, you know, uh, that mirror, the point is that these uh, instruments mirror the underwritten insurance obligations. Demand for this type of securities is large given that the correlation of returns with the business cycle is low and the preservation of biodiversity is the new green. Investors focused on generating positive environmental impact should be brought in as, the demand, as they demand lower returns, which cause insurance premia to fall, but also are likely to demand effective and transparent restoration capacities at natural protected areas. Thus, impact investors are doubly positive to this insurance scheme. One caveat though, since issuing securities with a minimum scale are needed in capital markets, it is necessary to bring in to this scheme as many natural protected areas as possible. The Mesoamerican coral reef that I was referring to is shared by Belize, Guatemala and Honduras, in addition to Mexico. Extending the insurance coverage to the entire Caribbean coral reef and even other coral reefs and mangroves menaced by tropical cyclones would provide the scale needed by capital markets. Based on the insurance scheme in Mexico, which the Nature Conservancy helped to arrange and finance, this NGO is currently collaborating with the Mesoamerican Reef Fund, a 2004 created private fund with representatives of Belize, Guatemala, Honduras, and Mexico to replicate this scheme in Belize, Guatemala, and Honduras. The Nature Conservancy is also exploring the application of insurance to other risks, for instance, that come from um, climate change, like coral bleaching and other eco ecosystems, as I was already referring, mangroves, forests, or in the, in the, U in the United States, Caribbean, and Asia Pacific. Pacific. Multilateral development banks could also play a role in scaling up these markets. They could contribute to co-financing co insurance of valuable ecosystem services against acute climate events seek reinsurance in capital markets by packaging these cut bonds or, or, the, or similarly resilient bonds or how we want to um, um, uh, to link to biodiversity preservation. Target impact investors and lastly provide technical assistance to managers of natural protected areas to guarantee proper disclosure of information to investors 
and the development of action plans to promptly react to climate events. This is what Jeffrey was referring to as organizational difficulties. Let us not forget that global warming is affecting coral reefs not only through stronger cyclones. With two degrees Celsius warming, most of the coral reefs of the world will disappear. And with it, this and other insurance markets. Sorry for finishing with a repetition of the obvious. Yes, we need to stop climate change before it is too late. Thank you. Thank you, Rafael. I think Andreas is uh, already uh, burning to, I think, to react to this and maybe also to address the question. Andreas, please. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Ulrike. I just finished. I'm going to be very quick. You cannot underestimate the importance of insurance in this regard. But if you look at the facts, we are unfortunately seeing a situation that more and more risks are becoming uninsurable. Look at the data, for example, at the Bank of England findings about that. So many of these hurricanes, you know, don't find the insurance protection as they did in the past. And that is something we have, you know, to really to address because if a risk becomes uninsurable, it by definition becomes a financial stability risk. And just as Raphael said at, at the end of his intervention, it is so important uh, uh, that we have much higher transparency on all of these issues, because only if there is transparency, uh, you can properly uh, price the consequences and then also make risks insurable. So again, Insurance risks are really, 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 you know, very, very uh, essential to the issue, but they are, un unfortunately, risks are becoming more uninsurable and we need to counter that with the need for much higher transparency, with the need for creating new uh, financing structures and, um, you know, with the need to build a pragmatic view to assess transition plans. And one of the biggest issues is that, at least to my opinion, that um, you know, transparency isn't that easy to create because all the you know the, the real issues of climate change are be beyond the time horizon. Now the issue here is with climate change: once you see it, it's too late. So you have to act earlier. But the normal research analyst will try to be as accurate as possible and will base his or her findings on historical data. But as we never had this climate change before, to use historical data and have to have and having a short time time frame will not do the trick and will not increase the transparency. And this is where we need to work on. I just wanted to make that point. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Andreas. Uh, maybe uh, to concretely ask Bertrand now, um, how would you concretely incentivize the scaling up of climate friendly investments? Uh, so we can achieve some de-risking, as you proposed in your earlier statement. Yes, I, I, I will follow up on what my, my colleague has said and what I've said before. I think we are at an interesting moment where, uh, I think as Jeff said, uh, ESG seems to be the name of the game. So ESG is a nice little cover. Uh, but the problem is that it's still very much based on, on self-declaratory uh, intentions. Uh, and, and there is no harmonization of measurements, reporting, etc. So it's very difficult to have a real idea of what is really going on. Uh, it, to put it in a nutshell and maybe in the moralistic terms, the system does not yet incentivize virtue and does not yet really punish uh, vice. So I, I mean, it, I don't want to be good and bad or you know, evil, etc. But sometimes you have to be very simple to, to pass the idea. Uh, and so that comes back to, to the point which everybody has hinted at. Uh, we have to work on the engine itself. So there are a number of things that we can already do within the system as it is today. And that's okay. We need to push as much as, we, as possible within the limits that we have today in our business. I've been CFO for many years, so I've been on the reporting track every quarter, and I know that the degree of freedom are very limited. But, but you still have some capacity to do things. Uh, but at the same time, we have to acknowledge that the system as it is today does not really uh, answer the questions and that we need to work on the system itself. And uh, so if we come back to the basics, uh, the risk return uh, analysis is a cornerstone of financial uh, industry. 
That's uh, what we've learned in business school. That's what we do. Uh, and that's what I'm doing actually uh, uh, as a daily business. It started actually, in fairness, more with the return aspect than with the risk. And that was, I would say, 19th century. You know, you dig in the ground, you find coal, etc. And when it's over, you move. Uh, but we sophisticated the approach of the 20th century, and, and with this risk return approach that we've kept sophisticating throughout the, the, the century, we have really the way we operate today. And, uh, and, and that's in that model that we incorporated climate risk. And we, we, we mentioned climate risk. I remember uh, the discussion we had with the Financial Stability Board in London uh, before COP21, where Mark Carney, as chair of the FSB, mentioned the risk of uh, the physical risk, the liability risk, and the transition risk. And we insisted on risk, and we insisted on fear. And that's what the company, I mean, listen and react to, I mean, insurance company, but also banks, etc. Uh, but we have to combine now fear and hope. Those are the two main drivers of, 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 of our behavior. Uh, and we also need to think, to, to think about all this as an opportunity. And I think this is a pivotal moment. We need to keep the risk framework, and it's very important for everything that has been discussed, in particular within the insurance industry. Uh, but, but we need also to move to the opportunity. It's, as I said, within our reach, uh, but we should not fool ourselves. Uh, we are not there yet. So we have to work on our financial model. Uh, the IRR is already a pretty complex thing. I mean, it looks simple. You say, yes, you have a 13.5% IRR, but you know what's behind it. I mean, you have thousands of Excel spreadsheet pages. And, and, and so it's a nice way to summarize a complex world. I'm afraid we need to go a step further. Uh, and we need to add in this equation the cost of uh, carbon emission, the cost of natural capital, the cost of human capital, social capital. I mean, these are things that we need to incorporate in our model uh, in order to build not just uh, a thing that, that lies on two feet, risk and return, but risk, return and impact, something like this. I mean, that's just to, to make it, again, a little bit maybe too simplistic. We, we, we need to remember uh, that profit is necessary. I, I have no doubt. I mean, profit is a necessity. If you're not profitable, you're not sustainable. But profit should not be an end to an end. It's a mean to an end. The profit is an outcome. Again, I've been a CFO. You know that profit is, uh, in a simple manner, revenues minus cost. And we all know around this table there are thousands of ways to calculate revenues and thousands of ways to calculate costs. In a way, if I want to be provocative, profit is a social norm. It's an outcome, and there are many ways to compute it. So we have to work on the way we measure profit and then the way we measure really the performance of what we are doing, which means that we have to work on two parallel tracks. The first one uh, is really to continue to push governments and, and regulators to work on norms and regulation. That's one aspect of it. But the second one, which is as important and probably which is critical factor today, is to change the market awareness. Uh, I, I believe we are still in a market economy, and that's good. Uh, in market economies are two important words, economy and market. And market is the consumers, is the workers, is the investors, the entrepreneurs, etc. All of these people can have a uh, capacity to influence the market. Uh, it's like water. Usually I make this comparison. Water, when you don't put any pressure, goes straight. Market economy, you don't put any pressure, goes straight. But if you put regulation and market pressure, it will go in the right direction. It's a very powerful tool. And I think we have to work with that. It's going to be a long effort, like for water, when you build dams, etc. It takes time. But it's, it's a way to channel this powerful tool where we need to go and basically to, to work on the essence of the operating system. If I want, again, to be very simplistic, to move away from the Friedman approach uh, the social uh, purpose of business is to increase profits to something which I'm borrowing from Colin Meyer from Oxford. The social purpose of business is to find profitable solution to the problem of this planet and its people. So profit is key, but it's about finding profitable solution to the problem of this planet and its people, in particular what we are discussing today, which is climate change. And we have to make it mainstream. It's not a side bucket. It should be incorporated in, in, in what we do every day. So there is a momentum which is building up. Again, I really like what you say, Andreas. You have a lot of assets. We have to use them. You have a lot of money. You have a lot of technology available to an extent which is rarely seen. Uh, but we're not doing enough with them. Uh, so we, we should never lose sight in, in what we discuss on the two tragedies that have been well identified, on the one the tragedy of the rise and the other and the tragedy of the commons. That's what we are facing today. We will not change it by, by just being incremental and doing nice little things, as I've done when I was at the World Bank or elsewhere, as I'm doing now, but by really uh, incorporating in the system a way to drive the system in a good direction, to unleash the forces within the system. 
And it's particularly true, and I'm very happy to, to, to meet you or to virtually meet you, Raphael, in emerging and developing economies. I believe that is where the new frontier is. I have, I mean, again, I'm, I'm going to be provocative to conclude. I believe that in Europe, the US and Japan, we are on track. I mean, it, it, it's never enough. It's never as fast as we expect, etc. But it's, it's, it's moving. Uh, the real challenge is going to be in, in emerging and developing economies. And we should not, I would say, as G7 people behave as bobos in paradise, and uh, like you know, the Paris people lecture the, the yellow jacket and say, guys, you know, we should change the way you behave. No, we should really be uh, partners. Uh, it's not about just uh, making Paris uh, agreement on COP21 sustainable development goals. It's also remembering that the same year, in 2015, we also signed, it's less known, a partnership for financing development, a partnership. So we need to really truly partner with emerging and developing economies. We need to bring new instruments. You need to bring a new approach. Uh, it's like vaccines. I mean, we will not save ourselves alone. We will save all planet together. And this will not work if we, not, if we do not find a way to channel the tools and, and instruments and money to where they are most needed, which is a place that Raphael eloquently described, which are emerging and developing economies. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Bertrand. Uh, maybe a follow-up question uh, to all of you. Um, uh, I think all of you have highlighted the importance of uh, new norms, new regulations, but also more transparency. Do you think that we will see the emergence of a global standard, uh, or do you think there will be more competition, for example, between Europe, the UK, the US and China? Uh, and basically also with the risk to get a suboptimal approach if everybody's trying to steer, as you have said, Bertrand, the water into a different direction. Maybe if we can start with Andreas. Uh, thank you. Now, competition is good because only uh, if there is desire to move forward and to be the first and uh, uh, that will help. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't develop some common principles and act um, in parallel, but I want competition because the circumstances, as Bertrand so rightly said, are so different uh, from you know country to country and from region to region. You know, at the end, I think while we also all need new instruments and we all need to do new things in this in this in this world, it is the classical system of risk management which needs to be done here. And um, this is a major risk, so we shouldn't forget about what we learned at business school. And risk management means you need to identify the risk. As Bertrand and others said, this is already being done. You know, I think we are there that we are identifying the risk. Then you have to monitor it and you have to manage it. And we are far from that. And only if we have competition, um, one region will sort of push the other and one region uh, will be more innovative and I think that's what we need. It's not, it's, you know, it's to the good for everybody if there is competition. We still have capital market economies and um, uh, capital market-based economies. We still have credit-based economies and there are different rules out there. So if we try to make it all equal, I don't think we would have the solution. Interesting point. Uh, maybe Bertrand? Yes, uh, I think for me it's, it's a very crucial question. And it goes beyond climate, actually. Uh, Europe has taken, uh, I would say, a, a, maybe a lead, maybe phrase it this way, in, in non-financial disclosure, including environmental, but also social. Uh, it has taken the lead the European way, through the norms, the regulation, directives, etc. That's what we do good, usually. Uh, but uh, there, is, there is also a push in the US, which is more market-driven. It's not so much uh, the, the Congress, which is really putting the framework, uh, but BlackRock, Bloomberg, S&P, etc. So uh, I believe it's okay today to have a competition. Like Andreas, I think it's a moment to unleash forces, and competition is probably pretty good. Uh, but I hope this competition will become a competitive cooperation. Uh, be because if, if it becomes a competition, if it's become an instrument of soft power, it might be very detrimental. The, the point is not so much Europe, US and China, because they are the three big blocks. But if tomorrow you are sovereign wealth fund in, uh, in the Gulf, for instance, you have money to invest, which kind of framework would you buy to? And this will have huge consequences to where you put your money. Etc. So that's why I think it's, it's better for everybody if we organize an appropriate cooperation. I don't see it coming, to be honest, today. I hope this conference will help. I think this is one of the places where you can build the convergence. 
but I think it's important. The worst outcome would be that in, if in three or four years, uh, the way we have not been able to organize the convergence of accounting standards, uh, we have competing systems uh, for, for non-financial disclosure, uh, where everybody say my system is better than yours, etc. And, and that would be bad for, for capital allocation. I very much liked your point on the uh, co competitive comp cooperation. I think that's, uh, that could certainly help to help us to go into the right direction. Maybe um, uh, that's another not a contradiction, not a contradiction. What I said, Bertrand, it is exactly right. Accounting standards and regulation need to be as similar, but otherwise, countries with a different background have yes, to push absolutely. in a different way. Fully agree. Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe just a brief uh, last question before we wrap up a um, uh, data question uh, that has also been brought up during the discussion that we have plenty of data, but the question is how can we uh, monitor and process the data that we have at hand? Maybe uh, to Jeff, um, do you think we have the right means and tools to accru accurately measure uh, climate risks and also calculate the imminent costs? Um, I, I think we're still early on that topic. I mean, we're, we're, we're in this, this interesting situation where we have a large quantity of data, but it sits often in uh, data lakes that don't really talk to each other. I like to, I like to use the metaphor of data rivers, and I, you know, I like to see more of these rivers combined. I mean, because the, uh, anyway, the short answer to your question is we're still very far away uh, of, of realizing the value of the data. So this, all this data is being collected, but it's still very noisy. It's not always well uh, joined, meaning that you, you're not joining multiple uh, databases. I think this is gonna be the challenge over the next two years. If we wanna realize any of these uh, uh, these ideas that we've been discussing, because they're, they're all very uh, data dependent. I think that's quite an important point. Now, obviously, as we get into specific countries and specific areas, you can find examples that are moving better than, than others, but I, I think this is still this is still a challenge uh, for governments, for uh, corporations, uh, and also for individuals. I mean, I, I should mention, uh, for example, it, it, it's still despite the fact that lots of data are being collected all over the place, it's still quite difficult as just a uh, an individual like interested party to go to any one website and credibly understand what you're seeing. And, and I think that, that there, there's a political uh, challenge that, that's quite important related to your previous comment. Uh, people need to be educated on this topic and data is part of that education. And since it's not always well visualized and it's not well curated, uh, that creates problems because then people don't trust it. So I think we need to think about that these different contexts, whether it be around governments or uh, different bodies that are trying to solve these problems or corporations. And yes. uh, Ulrike, if I may um, uh, yes. add to, to this, I, um, just um, going back to uh, Bertrand's point that the system does not yet incentivize virtue, I think it, this, this applies very much to data also, because, um, uh, you know, um, what, what we are seeing, and there is a real danger, is that, uh, you know, our firms will re uh, reveal only those data that, you know, look, make them look good. Uh, and, and, uh, and so uh, it, it's very natural. You, you, why should you uh, reveal data that, that is not, uh, uh, not helping you? No? So we, we do that as humans. Uh, but um, I think... Um, uh, and, and that is that brings me to the point also that Bertrand was very forcefully and clearly making about you know markets uh, and the incentives that markets can provide. And I, and coming from 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 the Americas continent, um, uh, perhaps with that um, bias, uh, I, I would say that um, that uh, market incentives are fundamental to to to, to solving this this data question. Uh, and uh, and I uh, I have some reservations as to you know regulations being able to really uh, address these issues. No, so so what I do see very clearly is this explosion. I mean, uh, in the ESG market, 
uh, this is a market that that a few years ago was ex was still very small, and and um, for last year I think it 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 reached the one billion dollar uh, in in sales. I mean, so so this this market is 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 increasing at an impressive uh, speed, and uh, and I think uh, what we what my view on the this is to sort of look to harness market forces for 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 this data question to be solved. Thank if you I very may, much. Ulrike, if I may, Ulrike, just uh, yes, one last are... from, from my side. It's really important to get the corporates on our side because, as all the other panelists said, it's the governments and the financial sector which is far ahead, and the corporates are lacking. And that's mm -hmm. what we should try. We should try to to, to get them on the bandwagon. I think yeah. this is a very good uh, point for us to close. Um, so we need to bring all stakeholders on board, including corporates. I would like to thank mm -hmm. all of you for sharing your expertise and for also uh, proposing practical solutions, how we can address the impact of climate change. I think our panel discussion has clearly shown that the financial se services sector will play a crucial role in facilitating the flow of financial resources to the best possible transformation initiatives and that new financial and insurance instruments may assist in better aligning incentives so that all stakeholders focus more of their efforts on addressing climate change. Also, I think what we have seen clearly is that innovation and transformation of processes, as well as proper measurement, reporting and disclosure of climate-related financial risks will be key. With this, I would like to say goodbye to everyone and I wish everyone a great continuation of the conference with our special guest, Joseph Stieglitz, who will be next on the conference agenda. For those who would like to join uh, Mr. Stieglitz, uh, please join uh, on the live stream over YouTube or on the BIS website. Thank you very much and have a nice day. Bye-bye.